Welcome to the subject agronomy. This is lecture seven, part two, on an introduction to fertility and crop nutrition. Please ensure that you watch lecture six and lecture seven, part one, before continuing if you haven't seen them already. My name is Dr. Nikki Cooley, and I am the coordinator of this subject and also this, the degree, the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology. This subject is run as part of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology, which is a partnership degree between Melbourne Polytechnic and La Trobe University. This subject is also a part of the Bachelor of Equine Studies. The Bachelor of Equine Studies is offered at Melbourne Polytechnic. Please visit our website at www.melbournepolytechnic.edu.au for further information on this subject and other courses and subjects that we offer. In lecture 7 part 2 we're going to look at the micronutrients. As a rule these are required in much smaller concentrations than the macronutrients but nevertheless as you are about to learn in this lecture they are very important for certain components of plant growth and development. There are a number of micronutrients and we are going to look in this lecture at boron, copper, chloride, iron, manganese, molybdenum and zinc. For each of these micronutrients we will quickly look at the function in plants, their soil content, interesting information on deficiency or toxicity symptoms, we will touch on their cycles and the fertilisers that you can use to commercially adjust for their deficiencies when they occur. So let us start with boron. Boron has several functions in plants. It is involved in RNA and DNA synthesis. It is also involved in the sugar transport across cell membranes, along with enzyme function, cell wall structure, cell division, flowering and fruiting. Many of these components are very important to the plant. When boron is found in the soil at a concentra concentration of less than 0.5 mg per kilogram, it is considered as deficient. When it is a concentration over 0.5, preferably between 1 to 4 mg per kilogram, it is considered as an adequate concentration. If you get too high levels of boron in the soil, you can get toxic impacts on your plants. So anything in the region of 12 mg of boron per kilogram is considered to be toxic. However, please note that these are boron available concentrations and not necessarily the concentration of boron per se in the soil. Usually an acidic well-drained sands give def um, can result in deficient boron content being present. Usually, if you have a highly alkaline, poorly leached, sodic clay subsoils, you can find um, boron as being toxic. Boron is highly immobile in plants. <clears throat> For example, alfalfa boron deficiencies are recognised as yellow and whitening of the youngest leaves and the terminal bud. Boron deficiency also results in shorter internodes, giving the plants an abnormal, busy-like appearance at the top of a stunted plant. It almost looks like a rosette appearance. Excess concentrations of boron can usually reduce crop yield and loss of quality as well. A boron toxicity looks like yellowing of the leaf tips, intervenal chlorosis and progressive scorching of the leaf margins. Boron toxicity is common in many soils. Unless fertilisers or compost containing high levels of boron are added. Examples of the field crops that are most sensitive to boron uh, toxicity include so corn and soybeans. Boron can result in poor fruit set in grapevines and deformed root or shoots. The plant soil system is dynamic and strongly influenced by weather. The key to controlling boron use efficiency is the system is sound fertilised management. 
that is using available knowledge to access fertiliser for and needs and implementing both the best efficiency in terms of farmer protocols. The boron cycle is a dynamic system changing daily and it is influenced by the soil plant system, the weather and fertiliser management. The global boron cycle is driven by a large flux of boron. The units that boron are often quoted in is teragrams. That is, one teragram is equal to 10 to the 12 grams or 10 to the 9 kilograms. This is a large unit. So the global boron cycle is prim primarily driven by a large flux, that is 1.44 teragrams, through the atmosphere derived from sea salt aerosols. Other significant <coughs> sources of atmospheric boron include emissions from the combustion of biomass and coal, which adds about 0 0.2, 0 0.2 teragrams of boron per year, as an anthropogenic contribution, anthropogenic meaning human. These known inputs to the atmosphere cannot account for the boron removed from the atmosphere during rainfall, which accounts for about three teragrams of boron per year, and estimated dry deposition of 1.3 to 2.7 teragrams of boron. In addition to atmospheric de deposition, Rock weathering is a source of boron, about 0.2 teragrams of boron per year for terrestrial ecosystems, and humans mine about 0.3 teragrams of boron from the Earth's crust. More than 4.8 teragrams of boron per year circulates in the biochemical cycle of land plants, and about 0.53 teragrams of boron per year is carried from the land to sea by rivers. The biochemical cycle of boron in the sea includes 4.4 teragrams, teragrams of boron per year cycling in the marine biosphere and an annual loss of 0.47 to the ocean crust by a variety of sedimentary processes that collectively remove only a small fraction of the total annual inputs of the ocean. Thus, our current understanding of the global biochemistry of boron, the atmosphere boron budget shows that greater inputs, while the marine budget shows inputs are greater than outputs. Despite these uncertainties, it is clear that human perpetration of the global boron cycle is more than doubled recently. There's only a finite source of those, these micronutrients in the soil. It is expected that micronutrient deficiencies will become more and more common with time, especially if organic matter continues to decline. No manure is added and a majority of the plant is harvested and removed. This you can think of as intensive farming, and if you undertake these practices, you must be mindful of boron, boron concentrations. Boron availability is dependent on several factors and conditions existing in the soil plant system, and is strongly influenced by rainfall, or rather the lack of it, during the growing season. Some of the factors that influence boron availability are soil organic matter, soil texture, and cultivation. Drought, microbial activity, soil pH and soil fertility. Please read your notes on this page for more detail about how these components can interact with boron. Boron fertilisers can be found as borax or boric acid. Let us now talk about the micronutrient copper. It is represented by the letter Cu and it has some important functions in plants. Copper is taken up as the copper or copric iron, Cu2+. Copper is also a component of enzymes, some of which are important in to lignin formation in cell walls. It is also involved in photosynthesis, respiration, and processes within the plant involving nitrogen. Copper is an important component of proteins found in the enzymes that regulate the rate of many biochemical reactions in plants. Plants would not grow without the presence of these specific enzymes.
Let's talk about the available soil copper content. The average total soil concentration of copper in parts per million is about 30, according to Lindsay in 1979. Five of the micronutrients, copper, iron, manganese, nickel and zinc, are metals. And they are primarily positively charged cations in soil water. Metals tend to behave similarly in the soil. Metals exist in one of four forms. In the soil, they can either be mineral, organic, sorbed, that means bound to the soil, or dissolved. The majority of metals in the soil are bound in minerals and organic matter and are unavailable to plants. Sorbed metals represent the third largest pool and are generally very tightly bound to soil surfaces although mineral, organic and sorbed metals are, ultimate, are intimately plant available and they can slowly release metals solution. The amount of copper available in plants varies widely by soils. Available copper can vary from 1 to 200 parts per million in both mineral and organic soils as a function of soil pH and soil texture. The finer texture mineral soils generally contain the highest amounts of copper. The lowest concentration are associated with the organic or peat soils. Availability of copper is related to soil pH. As soil pH increases, becomes more alkaline, the availability of this nutrient decreases. Copper is not mobile in soils. It is attracted to soil organic matter and clay minerals. The amount of available copper is measured by extracting the soil with a DTPA solution. The concentration of copper in the extract is then me measured. This procedure is most effective and accurately and reliable. It's necessary for carbohydrate and nitrogen metabolism and inadequate copper results in, st in the stunting of plants. Copper also required for lignin synthesis which is needed for cell wall strength and prevention of wilting. Deficiency symptoms of copper are dieback of stems and twigs, yellowing of leaves, stunted growth and pale green leaves that wither easily. Copper deficiencies are mainly reported on sandy soils which are low in organic matter. Copper uptake decreases as soil pH increases. Increased phosphorus and iron availability in soils decrease as copper uptake by plants. Evidence of copper deficiency can appear as small grains. These deficiency symptoms are characterised by a general light green to yellow colour in the small grain crop. The leaf tips die back and the twigs are twisted. A typical deficiency symptom for wheat is shown in, the image of, in various images you can find online. The image on the screen is a typical banana plant deficiency. The link to this resource is on your handouts. Please feel free to read this interesting um, slide share net production at your leisure. If copper deficiency is severe enough, growth of small grains ceases and plants die back after reaching the, till, uh, the tillering growth stage. Wheat will not have grain in the head with copper deficiency. deficiency. Deficiency symptoms have only been observed with small grains are grown on peat soils. As well as deficiency, copper toxicity can result. We are not covering that here. Like zinc, copper cycles include solution copper. This includes soluble copper and organic matter complexes known as cleats. Exchangeable copper on the cation exchange site of the soil particle. Primary and sec secondary copper minerals. Copper may be uh, occurred or buried within the structures of various minerals such as iron and aluminium oxides. Organic um, complexes of copper exist. In these complexes, copper is more tightly bound to organic matter than the other micronutrients. Organic deficiencies can occur in organic soils. Organic containing minerals can dissolve and supply zinc to the soil solution. Like zinc, copper can be, copper can be immobilised by microorganisms, taken up by plants or exchanged on soil particulate surfaces. Copper may also form cleats 
with soluble organic matter. Organic copper must be mineralised before it is available for plant uptake. Copper can be found in two uh, forms, copper 2 plus or just copper. Copper fertilisers. Please see the slide for a link which is a very useful summary of copper fertilisers. The need for copper in a fertilising programme can be predicted from either plant analysis or soil testing. Interpretations for various concentrations of copper in plant tissue are summarised on Table 1 from the UMA Education Extension. The results of analysis of plant samples can indicate what is happening in the past, but cannot reliably predict the future needs for copper. The results of soil tests are much better predictor of the need for copper in a fertilisation programme. Copper recommendations are based on soil tests are listed in another resource which can be found on the following link. Copper fertilisers include copper sulphate which is also a fungicide. Copper oxide contains 0.05 to 0.5% copper. Copper EDTA, which is actually quite hard to get hold of these days, contains 0.05% copper. Po copper can come in a solid form or a liquid fertiliser. Foliar applications of copper can be an effective way to correct copper deficiencies in small grains. The stage of the growth at the time of the application has a major influence on the effectiveness of the treatment. Research has shown that cereal crops grown on organic soils greater than 30% organic matter to a depth of 30 centimetres often respond to copper fertilisation. More recently, copper deficiencies have been identified in wheat, barley and oats grown on mineral soils in the black and black grey zones of Alberta in Canada. Copper deficiency soils tend to be either sandy or light loam soils with relatively high levels of organic matter matter. Here in Australia, where we also have sandy and light loam soils, additions of copper may be required. High levels of soil phosphorus or heavy applications of manure are often associated with copper deficiency on these soils. Wheat, barley and oats are the most sensitive to copper deficiency. Park spring wheat and condor barley are varieties that are more sensitive to copper deficiency and show the most obvious disease symptoms. Rye and canola are relatively tolerant to copper deficiency. Let's talk about iron. This is abbreviated to FE. Iron function in plants, like many of the other micronutrients, is important in certain components. Iron is one of the most abundant elements on the planet. In 1844, Espedard Griss showed that certain chlorosis in plants could be reversed by treating roots and leaves with iron solutions. Iron is essential for the formation of chlorophyll. As we have um, mooted before, chlorophyll is important in the process of photosynthesis, particularly pertaining to the light reaction. Although iron is required by plants in small amounts, iron is involved in many important components of physiological processes such as the manufacturing of chlorophyll and it is also involved in certain enzyme functions. Iron's involvement in chlorophyll synthesis is the reason for chlorosis or the yellowing associated with the iron deficiency. Iron is found in the iron containing heme proteins in plants, examples of which are the cytochromes. Cytochromes are found in the electron transport chain and in chloroplasts and mitochondria. Iron is also associated with certain non-heme proteins such as ferrodoxin. Iron can also be involved in the uptake of other nutrients and respiration. Sources of iron are found in the soil as iron sulphate or iron chelate. The most abundant form of soils is ferric oxide with the formula Fe2O3. Or you can also find iron as hemorrhite, which is extremely insoluble and impairs a red color to the soil. 
The oxide form of iron is commonly hydrated. In aerobic soils, that is soils with oxygen in them, the oxide, hydrooxide and phosphate forms control the concentration of iron in the solution and its availability to plants. In typically aerated plant production systems, an acceptable reaction pH plus or minus 0.6, sorry, pH plus or minus 6, the concentrations of ferric Fe3 plus and ferrous Fe2 plus iron are on the order of 10 to 15 molar, very low concentrations. As pH increases by one unit, activity of Fe3 plus ferric iron decreases by a thousandfold due to the formation of insoluble Fe3 plus hydroxide under reducing conditions. Addition of H plus or other, other reductants controls iron solubility and it can increase. Under such situations, iron can be absorbed, absorbed on soil, that means attached to the soil particles as an exchangeable iron. In certain soil situations, carbonate or sulphide compounds <clears throat> may form iron. Commonly in waterlogged situations, anaerobic, ferric iron is reduced to the ferrous state. If sulphides also are abundant in the soil, they become oxygen sources for bacteria and black coloured ferrous sulphide is formed. Where organic matter is present in the soils, iron may be present in the reduced state as iron 2 plus in the soil solution or adsorbed onto soil particle surfaces. Organic acid in soils plays a major role in the availability of iron to plants. Biochemical compounds or organic acids and complex polymers can form soluble complexes with iron or as chiquiting agents. Therefore, increases in iron availability to plants Chakleting agents are organic compounds that complex with iron and hold, help hold iron in more soluble forms. If the soil concentration of iron is less than 2 mg per, kilo, per uh, kilogram, it is said to be deficient. Adequate concentrations are about 2 to 5 percent or 50 to 500 mg per kilogram. Iron is involved in the production of chlorophyll <clears throat> and iron chlorosis is easily recognised on iron sensitive crops growing in calcareous soils. Iron also is a component of many enzymes associated with energy transfer, nitrogen reduction and fixation. The ligation formation. Iron is associated with sulphur in plants to form compounds that catalyse other reactions. Iron deficiencies are mainly manifested by yellow leaves due to the low levels of chlorophyll. Leaf yellowing first appears on the younger upper leaves in the intervenal tissues. Severe iron deficiencies causes leaves to turn completely yellow or almost white and the brown as the leaves die. Iron deficiencies are found in, mainly found on high pH soils, although some acid, sandy soils low in organic matter, may also be iron deficient. Cool wet weather enhances iron deficiencies especially on soils with marginal levels of available iron. Poorly aerated or compacted soils also reduce iron uptake by plants. Uptake of iron decreases with increased soil pH and is adversely affected by high levels of available phosphorus, mang manganese and zinc in soils. Iron can be found in the iron 3 plus or the iron 2 plus form and there are certain circle, uh, cycling that iron undertakes. Iron can cycle in mineral and or organic forms. Mineral iron may not exist in the soil solution and it includes soluble iron and organic matter complexes in the form of cleates as primary minerals or precipitated minerals. Iron can form cation exchange sites on the soil particles. 
Iron containing minerals may dissolve to replenish the soil solution as iron is removed by plants. Little iron is retained by the cation exchange of the soil particles as compared to base and acid cations. Iron can be uh, found in organic iron forms. Organic cycling is an important process that ensures iron availability through the process of mineralization and immobilization. Iron chelation can iron can cause strong complexes with organic matters known as cleates, a Greek word meaning claw. Cleation occurs between the soluble organic compounds and certain metals in the soil through the processes involving microorganisms. Cleates are very important in micronutrient management because cleation increases the solubility and plant uptake in many metal micronutrients. Plants have a requirement for iron on the order of 1.2 to 1.8 kilograms of iron per hectare compared with nitrogen at 96 to 240 kilograms per hectare. Plant tissue analysis for iron are problematic to interpret unless the leaves have been rinsed in dilute acid or detergent. The problem arises because iron is ubiquitous in dust and can be a contaminant on the surface of plant leaves. Most tests rely on the analysis of young leaves from the upper parts of the extremities of the plants. Young leaves are chosen because iron, once deposited in the leaf tissue, is not readily re-translocated, that means moved around the plant. Hence, older leaves of deficient plants may have a relatively high concentration of iron. Younger leaves of most plants should contain about 50 parts per million of iron or greater on a dry weight basis. Deficient plants have leaves with less than 30 parts per million of iron and will likely exhibit the chlorosis typical of iron deficient plants. Several soil testing methods have been tried for predicting crop needs for iron fertilizers. Of several extra extractants tested for exchangeable iron, sodium acetate and ED EDDHA factors such as soil pH and bicarbonate concentration in addition to the extractable amount of iron. Therefore it is important there will be a very reliable soil test method until these factors are better understood. It might be more useful to have information on soil pH and bicarbonate content of the soil sample and relate the information of iron availability accordingly. Iron can be applied as fertilizers in several forms and by several methods. Consideration must be given to the soil chemical reactions that affect iron solubility and plant availability. Over the years, many materials have been tested and used as fertilizers. Crop response research with dry iron fertilizer sources tends to favor the cleated forms of the inorganic forms of iron. The preferential selection might be due to the, as to the sparingly soluble nature of inorganic salts, such as iron oxides, and also to rapid precipitation of iron solu solubilized from these salts before the plant can absorb the iron especially in soils with high pH and bicarbonate levels. Fluid ammonium polyphosphate fertilizers were found to be effective carriers of iron sulfates for crops grown on iron deficient soils, presumably because the iron solubility was enhanced. Since iron, a micronutrient, is required in small amounts in the plant, there also is the issue of uniformity of application to the crop. Fertilizers in which the dry nutrient salt is blended can be problematic because the soil amounts of micronutrient are not uniformly mixed and the material tends to settle out. Settling is a particular problem with bulk blended fertilizers. Therefore, the iron needs to be distributed uniformly in the fertilizer material. Homogenized fertilizers and liquid materials are manufactured in a way to incorporate all nutrients uniformly in each fertilizer particulate or in the solution. Because of the very low concentrations of iron 3 plus and iron 2 plus in soils, 
Clahated forms of iron fertiliser generally perform better for plant responses and iron uptake than dry iron oxides or sulphates for some crops. Not all crops respond to iron additions and responses have been shown to be variable. Iron cleate fertilisers effectiveness depends on the soil pH, for example. Iron EDTA is less stable in highly <coughs> calcareous soils. <coughs> Responses to polyflavonoids and ligand sulfates have been variable and large amounts of the product are needed. Foliar applications of iron have resulted in more uniform success for connecting plant iron deficiencies. Applying iron directly to the leaves circumvents the problems associated with iron application in the soil. Iron sulfates and many types of cleates have been used and are recommended in some areas. For example, a, a typical recommendation would be 3% solution of iron sulfate sprayed in leaf wetness. Addition of 0.1% urea to the iron sulfate solution may significantly increase the iron uptake because iron is electronically charged but urea is not. Urea can facilitate iron uptake and foliar application. An interesting approach to managing iron deficiency problems is to ca ca capitalise on the abundant variation in iron uptake, transport and utilisation in plants. Some genotypes of certain plants, for example soybean, differ for their sensitivity of iron deficiency. There is a gene generic basis for this variation, so the iron efficient varieties can be developed that tolerate soil inheritability low in iron that might otherwise not enable economic crop production. Molecular genetic approaches take advantage of the knowledge and the physiological basis for plant responses of iron deficiency could play a role. For example, by increasing the phytosiderophorone product production. Let us now look at manganese. Manganese is abbreviated to NN and it has a, a various functions in plants. These functions include enzyme systems involved in the breakdown of carbohydrates and nitrogen metabolism. It controls several oxidation reduction systems and photosynthesis. Manganese is involved in the splitting of water in photosynthesis. Manganese can also aid nutrient uptake in plants. Lindsay in 1979 looked at 600 average total soil concentrations of manganese. Manganese found in the soil as a metal absorbs or absorbs strongly because they are generally positively charged. And most soil surfaces such as clay and organic organic matter are negatively charged. For example, four of the five essential metals are positively charged at pH 7.5. Metals sorb to clays, organic matter and hydroxides, which is directly related to the cation exchange capacity of the soil. High levels of manganese in the soil can cause iron deficiencies. Therefore, if a soil is found to have less than 1.7 mg per kilogram of manganese, we say it is probably deficient. Adequate concentrations range from 25 to 100 mg per kilogram of available manganese. Toxic levels can be seen by pH dependent reactions or by the, the response of the crop. Necessary in photosynthesis, nitrogen metabolism, and to form other compounds required for plant metabolism. Intervenal chlorosis is characteristic of manganese deficiency symptoms. You can see an example of this on the slide. In very severe manganese cases, brown necrotic spots appear on leaves, resulting in premature leaf drop. Delayed maturity is another deficiency symptom in some species. White grey spots on the leaves of some cereal crops can also indicate magnesium deficiency. Magnesium deficiencies <clears throat> mainly occur in organic soils with high pH. 
sandy soils low in organic matter and on an over lined soil. Soil manganese may be less available in dry well aerated soils but can become more available under wet soil conditions when manganese is reduced to the plant available form. Deficiency symptoms are commonly observed following cool wet conditions in spring. Oats are more susceptible to manganese deficiency than other cereal crops. Organic soils with high pH are the most likely to respond to manganese fertilizer. Conversely, manganese toxicity can result in some acidic high manganese soils. Uptake of the manganese decreases with increased soil pH and is adversely affected by the high levels of available iron in the soils. In legumes, deficiency symptoms include, include pale green young leaves and a pale yellow mottling develops in the intervenal areas, while the veins remain green. Oats are an excellent indicator crop. Manganese is partly mobile in oats. White to grey flecks or specks first appear and become more severe on mature leaves about halfway up the shoot. If a deficiency persists, symptoms spread to old leaves then to younger leaves. The speckle condition is re referred to as grey speck and will appear in the intervenal area of the lower half of older leaves and extend towards the tip as symptoms develop. Manganese is not readily transferred from the old to the young leaves in wheat and barley. In wheat and barley affected young leaves frequently turn pale green and have a limp wilted appearance. A mid intervenal chlorosis develops in the midsection of the leaf and spreads rapidly becoming pale yellow green. Small white to grey spots, specks or stripes appear in a short distance from the end of the leaf tip to young leaves. Manganese can delay veraisons in wine grapes and table grape. This is very similar to the iron cycle. The manganese cycle too has four fractions. Manganese, manganese cations are found in the soil solution and these include soluble manganese and organic matter complexes known as cleates. Exchangeable manganese of soil particles are found at cation exchange sites. Primary and secondary manganese containing minerals can also be found. Manganese is found in the soil organic matter. Like iron, little manganese is related by the cation exchange sites of soil partic uh, particles. Manganese may undergo precipitation or dissolution, sorption and desorption of the CEC, mineralization, immobilization and chiatin. If the manganese soil test is below the target level and dolomitic limestone was not applied, soluble man manganese should be included in the basic application of fertilizers for most field and crops. Application of at least um, 10 pounds per acre, acre of mangane, ma, manganese is recommended. Since lime is seldom used for chloro-cured tobacco, the fertilizer for this crop should contain at least 24 kilograms per hectare of manganese. As a rule, broad case applications are seldom effective. For cereals, a seed place treatment of manganese sulfate should be the most effective foliage application and can also be used if deficiency symptoms develop during the growing season. The foliar spray is found in the form of manganese sulfate. Platinum, or MO for short, is involved in enzyme systems relating to nitrogen fixation by bacteria growing symbiotically with legumes. Nitrogen metabolism protein synthesis and sulfur metabolism are also affected by molybdenum. If you find it difficult to pronounce molybdenum, often in the commercial arena or agronomy, we just call it molly. Plants absorb molybdenum as molybdate. The form in which molybdenum is translocated is currently unknown. Molybdenum is located prim primarily in the phloem and the vascular parenchyma and is only moderately mobile in the plant. 
The requirement of molybdenum in terms of dry matter is usually in the range of 0.1 to 1 parts per million, depending on the crop. Most plants are very tolerant of excess amounts of molybdenum in the tissues, with levels above 1,000 parts per million existing without any recorded harmful effects in many species. A unique feature of molybdenum nutrition is the wide variation between the critical deficiency and toxicity levels. This is unusual. These levels may differ by a factor of up to 10 to the magnitude 4. Molybdenum is an essential component of two major enzymes in plant, nitrogenase and nitrate reductase. Nitrate reductase is the most well-suited molybdenum containing enzyme. It catalyzes the reduction of NO3 to NO2. Molybdenum is an anion macronutrient and is taken up by plants by the molybate ions MO4. MO04. Molybdenum is an essential micronutrient that enables plants to make use of nitrogen as we've stated in the previous slide. Without molybdenum, plants cannot transform nitrate nitrogen to amino acids and legumes cannot fix atmospheric nitrogen. Molybdenum is found primarily in minerals or is sorbed strongly to the soil surface. The factors that affect mineralization, immobilization and erosion of these anion, anion micronutrients are covered in the following slide. The molybdenum deficiency can occur in acidic sandy soils. Limiting the soil to pH 6 will correct the problem. Soil applications, foliar applications or coating seed with molybdenum are also effective. Cauliflower is the main vegetable crop sensitive to low le levels of molybdenum in the soil. The content of molybdenum in most agricultural soils is usually between 0.6 and 3.5 parts per million with an average molybdenum content of about 2 parts per million and an average available molybdenum content of about 0.2 parts per million. Molybdenum largely occurs in the soil as an oxy complex MOO4. Because of this molybdenum more resembles phosphate or sulphate in its behaviour in the soil. In a similar way to those to ions, molybdenum is absorbed by soil minerals and colloids. The absorption is closely dependent on the soil pH. At neutrality, it is very low, but increases as the pH falls, falls or becomes more acidic. Molybdenum availability to plants is thus poorest in acidic soils and is improving by limiting, provided the soil is not inherently deficient in molybdenum. Deficient levels are regarded at 0.5 mg per kilogram or less, but please remember it is pH dependent. An adequate soil concentration can be between 0.5 and 4 mg per kilogram. Molybdenum soils contain enough molybdenum in available forms to adequately meet the needs of most crop plants. In some areas, however, particularly on acidic soils, that is a pH less than 5.5. Molybdenum deficiency can arise because of the high molybdenum fixation in the soil. The geographical pattern of molybdenum deficiency mainly follows the regions of acid, sandy soils, although the effect may be masked by the common use of lime. Therefore, molybdenum deficiency can be found in Australia as we do have such soils. The requirement for molybdenum by plants is varied. The cruciferi, particularly the cauliflower and cabbage plants, have a high molybdenum demand. The same also applies to legumes because of the requirement of the root nodule bacteria that we discussed earlier. In a survey in the US of 21 states, alfalfa was found to be the most common crop species showing molybdenum deficiencies, followed by cauliflower, broccoli, soybeans, clover and citrus. In general, the monocots are not very sensitive to molybdenum. These results can be taken on board and used in the Australian climate. Since the most important function of molybdenum in plant metabolism is the NO3 nitrate reduction, 
molybdenum deficiency resembles nitrogen deficiency. Plants suffering from the molybdenum deficiency are restricted in growth. Their leaves become pale and eventually wither. Flower formation may be restricted. In dicotyledons, a drastic reduction in the size and irregularities of the leaf blade formation or whiptail are the most typical visual symptoms. These are caused by local necrosis in the tissue and insufficient differentiation of vascular bundles at the early stages of plant leaf development. Molybdenum has a significant effect on pollen formation, so fruit and grain formation are affected by molybdenum deficient plants. Because molybdenum requirements are so low, most plant species do not exhibit molybdenum deficiency symptoms. These deficiency symptoms in legumes are mainly exhibited as the nitrogen deficiency symptoms because of the primary role of the molybdenum in nitrogen fixation. Unlike other micronutrients, molybdenum deficiency symptoms are not confined mainly to the younger sleeves because molybdenum is mobile in plants. The characteristic <coughs> molybdenum deficiency symptom in some vegetable crops is a regular leaf blade formation known as whiptail, but intervenal mottling and marginal corrosives of older leaves have also been observed. Molybdenum deficiencies are found mainly on acidic sandy soils in humid regions. Molybdenum uptake by plants increases with soil, increased soil pH, which is opposite that of the other more economic economical than limiting in some areas. Stunting and lack of vigour may also be seen. Similar to nitrogen deficiency, the role of molybdenum in nitrogen used by plants, and this can confuse the symptoms. Marginal scalding and cupping or rolling of the leaves can be also seen. In grapevines, you may see the hen and chicken symptoms as shown on the figure one. This is in an image from Merlot and it's from the Wine Australia report. Please refer to the link if you'd like more information on molybdenum deficiency in grapevines in Australia. Obvious metal micronutrients, molybdenum exists as an anion in the soil solution. Nevertheless, the molybdenum cycle is similar to the others. Molybdenum cycle includes soil solution, where it can be found, exchangeable molybdenum on the anion exchange sites, both primary and secondary molybdenum minerals, it can occur in organic matter. Molybdenum, instead of being held in, onto the cation exchange capacity, is held to soil particles with an anion exchange capacity. This includes amorphous materials, iron oxides, acidic kaolin clays, Organic molybdenum undergoes both mineralization and immobilization. The common fertilizer for molybdenum is sodium molybate Na2MO4H2O. Ammonium molybdenate NH42MO2O2-4HTO can also be found. And molybdenum is highly flow and mobile. Foliar application is an appropriate and effective procedure for correcting for molybdenum deficiencies. Since, since plants require such a low level of molybdenum, it does not take much to increase the leaves, increase levels in the leaves, sorry. Given the fact that small amounts are required, nutrition suppliers for molybdenum as a nutrient availability of metosulfate Molten mineral ore, also as met metal oslate tropical. In each of these products, the level of molybdenum is about 0.1%, but you must refer to the individual manufacturers in order to get this percentage. At about 0.1, it has been proven by the scientific literature to be effective for increasing plant tissue levels to the ranges that are acceptable for your crop production. Turn our attention to zinc. There are several functions of zinc in plants. Zinc is an essential component of various enzyme systems for energy production, protein synthesis, and growth regulation. Zinc is essential for the transformation of carbohydrates. 
zinc regulates the consumption of sugars. And part of the enzyme systems are regula that regulate plant growth require zinc. If zinc soil concentration is found less than one mg per kilogra uh, kilogram, we say it's deficient. Sources of zinc are soil, zinc oxide, zinc sulfate and zinc cleate. The amount of plant available zinc in the soil is a function of pH. Soluble zinc concentrations usually decrease with an increase in soil pH. The amount of plant available zinc in the soil with a pH of about 8 is 100 times less than that found in a similar soil with a pH of 7. However, high pH soils are not always zinc deficient. Wheat and barley, for example, can get all the zinc they need out of most soils within a pH of 7. High pH soils that contain lots of calcium carbonate are sometimes zinc deficient because zinc reacts with the carbonates to form insoluble and unavailable compounds. Zinc deficient plants also exhibit delayed maturity. Zinc is not mobile in plants, so zinc deficiency symptoms occur mainly in new growth. Poor mobility in plants suggests the need for a constant supply of available zinc for optimum growth. The most visible zinc deficiency symptoms are short internodes and a decrease in leaf size. Delayed maturity also is also a symptom of zinc deficiency plants. Zinc deficiencies are mainly found on sandy soils, low in organic matter. Zinc deficiencies occur more often during the cold, wet spring weather and are related to reduced root growth and activity, as well as low microbial activity, which can result in decreases in zinc release from the soil organic matter. This is important in Australia when you have wet cold years. Zinc uptake by plants decreases with increased soil pH. Uptake of zinc also is adversely affected by high levels of available phosphorus and iron in soils. Zinc is usually found in the soil in the zinc 2 plus form. Zinc cycling includes cation zincs in the soil solution. This includes soluble zinc and organic matter complexes known as chiates. Zinc related by soil particles on the cation exchange sites can also be shown in the cycling of zinc. Cycling of zinc involves primary and secondary zinc containing minerals. Zinc can be cycled in the soil organic matter as we previously described. Zinc bearing minerals can dissolve and supply zinc to the soil solution. Once in the soil solution, zinc can immobilize, be taken up by plants, retained by soil particles, or created with soil organic matter. Organic matter containing zinc must undergo mineralization before it comes available to the plants. The treatment of zinc deficient soils where a sensitive crop such as beans or corn is grown, a a blend of um, zinc sulfate or zinc EDTA foliar spray can be applied. When zinc deficiencies are suspected early in the growth season, a foliar application is probably the best way to overcome this. If you have a severely deficient crop, say such as beans, you may require two applications. Eroded soils can that have been broadcast and incorporated the application of zinc sulfate may also be tried to fix your zinc deficiency issues. Now let's move our attention to chloride. That's abbreviated to CL. Chloride has multiple roles in the function of plants. It aids plant metabolism. It is involved in osmosis, diffusion and passive transports and these are important factors that help regulate membrane and cellular structure. Osmosis will occur if a gradient is present. Plant cells in a soil hypertonic solution will lose water across its membrane and cause the plant cells to shrink. However, all cells have salt which is critical in the regulation and balance. 
it is important to have the critical levels so equilibrium and isotonic balance between plant and the soil exists. Low levels of soil salts or a hypertonic solution will cause the reverse condition and it may be just as severe. If soils were chloride deficient, it would actually be beneficial to add chlorine, chloride since the plant roots absorb chloride, which is important in the process of photosynthesis. Also, chloride is beneficial in controlling plant disease, inhibit inhibiting inhibiting sorry conversion of nitrogen to NH4 and helping with manganese uptake. The physical regulation of osmosis and diffusion, which include transport nutrients, sugars, amino acids and organic acids, are important factors dependent on salts such as chloride. All of these factors will indirectly influence the effects of plant either positively or negatively which will directly reflect on the plant's ability to withstand external stress and resist disease and physical damage from insects. Chloride is an essential element for all plants, but it is only required in small quantities similar to other trace elements. Actual concentrations of chloride content of plants can vary with species and the stage of growth. Like many other substances, Chloride is not harmful to the plant, animal or microbial life in normal quantities, but it is undesirable if it's in excess concentrations. It's active in energy reactions in the plant. Most chloride in soils comes from the salt trapped by in parent materials, marine aerosols and volcanic emissions. Classified as a micronutrient, chlorophyll of chloride is required by all plants in small quantities. Research has shown that chloride diminishes the effects of fungal root disease such as takel and common rot root on small grains. It also helps suppress infections of small grain fungal leaf and head diseases. Researchers have correlated lower incidences of stalk rot in corn to adequate chlorophyll uh, chloride concentrations. Chloride can be applied in a broadcast manner or top dress with nitrogen. The most practical solution to is to uh, supply potassium chloride, which contains about 47% chloride. You can pre-plant at seedling and top dress applications have also been shown to be effective. Higher rates should be applied, pre-plant and top dress. Symptoms of chloride deficiency can vary across the crop species, but similarities exist for how nutrient insuff insufficiency impacts plant tissue colour and appearance. Nutrient deficiencies are commonly associated with the physical location of the plant, i.e. whether the symptoms are primarily observed on older versus newer formed plant tissue, but these symptoms can spread as severely of the deficiency process. Wilting is a common symptom of chloride deficiency and transpiration is also affected and the plant is often chlorotic. <coughs> chloride toxicity symptoms including burning of the leaf tips and margins, bronzing, premature yellowing and abscission of leaves. Seedlings and tuba will exhibit root and shoot scorch. Damage from excess chloride normally results from osmotic effects. Osmotic effects for your revision are the moving of water across nutrient concentrations. And these are associated with the above toxicity symptoms. Other physiological effects are not well defined, but can include reduced carbon dioxide assimilation and reduced protein synthesis. Chloride is easily absorbed by leaves and scorch can result in coastal districts from sea spray and saline drift. Plant species differ considerably in their sensitivity to chloride excess with sugar beet, barley and rape being highly tolerant, wheat, grasses and potatoes intermediate, while peas, beans, clover and other legumes can be particularly sensitive. Because of the effect is one of the osmotic pressure 
the sensitivity also varies with the moisture holding capacity of the soil and the soil moisture content. Fluoride in the soil is found to be deficient at less than 8 parts per million. It's found to be adequate between 8 and 22 parts per million and if you have a concentration of about 30 parts per million or plus you can find it toxic. Because chloride is mobile anion in plants, most of its functions relate to the salt effects, i.e. stomatal opening, and the electrical charge balance of physiological functions in plants. Chloride also indirectly affects plant growth by stomatal regulation of water loss. Wilting and restricted, highly branched root systems are the main chloride deficiency symptoms, which are found mainly in cereal crops. Most soils contain sufficient levels of chloride for adequate plant nutrition. However, reported chloride deficiencies have been reported on sandy soils in high rainfall areas, or those deprived from low chloride parent materials. There are few areas of chloride deficient, so this micronutrient sorry, generally is not considered in fertilization programs. In addition, Chloride is added to soils with potassium chloride, the predominant potassium fertilizer. The role of chloride in decreasing the incidence of various diseases in smaller grains is perhaps more important than its nutritional value from a practical viewpoint. Plants differ in their requirements for certain micronutrients as we are learning in this lecture. It's been suggested that the biological activity of soil is adversely affected by chloride additions in fertilisers. Soil biology is immensely complex and its measurement at present is very imperfect, but there is no reliable scientific evidence to support this connection. The successful use of murate as potash source for 150 years to produce flourishing and increasingly productive crops appears to be a clear practical evidence referring refuting such claims. The existence of healthy ecosystems in coastal regions of the world which require enormous quantities of chlorine from rain is further evidence that chloride addition is not a problem. It is also emphasized that murate is prohibited in organic production and some claim this is because of its chloride content. However, this is totally contradicted by the allowable use of cured salts such as sylvanite and kainite within the organic rules, as these materials respectively contain 2.8 and 4.8 times as much chloride as the murate per unit of potash. Chloride fertilizers tend to come as two products, potassium chloride or potash. Etiols are the stalk end of the leaf structure. White et al. in 2003 developed some guidelines that enable growers to consider if fertigation for of their block is required. You randomly collect a number of petioles from your vineyard block and send them away for nutrient concentration analysis. You can then compare your information with the table. If your nutrient level is low, it can confirm suspected deficiency and you can moderate your fertigation program to best match your vineyard's needs. That brings us to the end of the section on micronutrients and in fact to the end of lecture seven. So let us review what we have learnt you will have learnt that there are two groups of nutrients and that these can be divided into metals and non-metals. Although they are required by the plant in small concentrations, when you review the many physiological roles that they have, such as plant nutrient uptake, plant health and optimal yield, you begin to understand that they are critical. It is at this point that you can compare your understanding of the law of minimum and how you can see that if one of those components was deficient, 
regardless if all the others were um, in adequate quantities, you would have a potential situation. That is, you wouldn't reach your optimal yield. It is worth noting that in many situations, adequate levels of most of your micronutrients are found in the soils. But where they are not, there are an array of commercial products exist, but often you need to understand your paddock or area's history, <clears throat> but also the, some of these symptoms can be quite complicated, so soil testing is a good first step. You may also have to test indirect measurements such as pH in order to confirm or help with the confirmation of your deficiency. If you apply a micronutrient, ensure you understand the soil characteristics associated with that nutrient. You must also understand the plant's physiological requirements. What stage is the plant at? Is this the best time to add this particular nutrient? And you also need to understand how additions of your micronutrient may interact with other cycles in the soil. Often micronutrients will compete for entry into the plant, so that you need to be mindful of this. Suitable nutrient management and nutrient cycling for your soils is important. That brings us to the end of this lecture. <coughs>